Hey everyone, welcome back. My name is Shaheen, and in this video, I'm going to be talking about how we can smooth financial time series data using something called wavelets. So this is a little different than past videos that you may have seen on my YouTube channel. What I usually do is videos in more of like a lecture type format where I start talking about theory and concepts and then usually finish up with a concrete example with code. But here I wanted to do something a little different Different. A real life use case came up when an old friend reached out for some help on a project that he's working on. And I thought it was such a wonderful example of what data science looks like in the real world. So in this video, I want to walk through the background and the problem that my friend was running into and walk through my thought process and how I arrived to the final solution for this problem. So I'm going to go through this Jupyter notebook, which kind of has step by step the, the whole story of what happened in this specific project. And you can find this Jupyter Notebook along with the data used in this example in the GitHub repo that is linked below in the description. So if you want to follow along or use these solutions for a problem that you're facing, feel free to download the code there. Okay, so let's get into it. So like I mentioned, the whole setup for this problem was my friend approached me because he was running into an issue in a project that he's working on. So the project was actually a tool that he's developing to automatically trade cryptocurrencies. And he has some strategy for executing these buy sell decisions that I don't fully know the details of, but he reached out to me because his strategy was all based on time series data that looks something like this. And so the problem that he was facing is that his strategy was starting to give undesirable results due to the volatility of this signal. So, I mean, just looking at this, we, we see like these crazy fast oscillations in this signal. So if your goal is to develop a automated trading system, you want it to be robust in a wide range of situations. And so I can see just looking at how noisy this time series is, how a strategy might break down. So this brings up a really good point. It highlights a mistake that a lot of data scientists make early on in that they're almost too eager to jump into the, the coding, jump into the technical details, jump into the math, the techniques, the algorithms, and don't don't take the time to take a step back and really ask themselves, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Why are we interested in this problem? What is it that we are truly after? Or what is it that the client is truly after? So kind of in line with that, my initial thoughts from this ask is, what is this data? It's very noisy. And it turns out to be, you know, quite a specific signal that's being extracted from cryptocurrency prices. It's something like the time averaged z-score over the past 45 minutes of a currency's trading price. So if that doesn't make any sense, don't worry, it's not going to be critical to the larger point of this use case. Okay, so my second thought was, why do you need to use this particular time series? So my initial thought is, if you're relying on a signal for your strategy and that signal is fundamentally unreliable or noisy, are there other data that we can look at and use for our strategy? And so in this case, there probably are. However, my friend had already developed his strategy that had worked well for him in the past based on this data. So that's the reason he wanted to stick with this particular signal. So even if these questions, like in this case, didn't change the direction of the analysis, it's good to make sure you have an understanding of the context and the bigger picture and where your collaborator is coming from and asking for your help with a data science project. After some conversation, understanding what this data is, getting a better idea of why he wanted to use this particular time series, and at least in the short term, kind of ruling out alternative strategies, my first thought was, well, why don't you just apply a moving average? So that's a very very simple way to take a noisy signal like this and make it more smooth. And so that brings us to the first solution. And as it turned out, this was a solution that my friend had already tried and it was still not giving him the results that he was looking for. And so, you know, without knowing too many details about his technique, there are just three possible issues that kind of jump out to me with this solution. So looking at this orange signal here, we still see that there are rapid 
changes in particular sections. So while this section looks pretty smooth, we can look back a little bit and we can see we still have time ranges where there's rapid oscillation and that is conceivably something that'll make a automated buy-sell strategy very unstable. The second thing is there are time shifting artifacts when we do moving averages. So for example, we can see that we have a peak in the original signal right here. However, in the moving averaged in the smoothed version of the signal using the moving average, that peak has actually shifted slightly to the right. And so we have these time shifting artifacts anytime we do a moving average. And it's kind of like this trade off, you know, you can make your moving average window very small, and you'll have less of these time shifting artifacts, but the signal is going to stay noisy. So we can actually look at that a little bit. So if I made the window size 10 and run this, we can see that the orange signal sticks pretty closely to the blue signal, and we don't have the time shifting artifact as much. Then on the other end, we can make the window size very large, and now we have a really smooth signal, but now the time shifting artifacts are very large. So this is likely not desirable, especially if you have a program that's executing buy sell decisions automatically, it might be a little late to the party. And then the third issue is the optimal window size for the moving average is likely dynamic. So just as we saw, like this window size dramatically changes how our smooth signal looks. And anytime you have to fix a, a parameter like this, it's easy to, let's say, overfit to a example time series that you use in development. So in other words, what that means is we might pick a window size of 25 and agree that it looks good on this data, but then let's say tomorrow we get new data and then 25 doesn't give us the desired outcome. For these reasons, the moving average is likely not going to be a a optimal solution for this specific use case. And so the first thing that came to mind, which was a complete failure, which is funny because I was so confident that this would solve the problem that my friend offered to, he offered to pay me for my time. And I was like, oh no, 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 this is gonna take like five minutes. Like don't even, like it's not even worth, it's not even worth it. Like the coffee you just bought me is, uh, <laughs> is equivalent to the amount of effort I'm gonna spend on this problem. And I was wrong. And thinking through it a little more, it kind of becomes obvious why this would fail. So this is a great example of when expectations and intuitions can fail. Like the, the gut reaction, the gut instinct can a lot of times mislead you when you're in kind of new territory. And so uh, let, let's kind of walk through the solution. So at a high level, the strategy is we have this signal, let's fit it to a polynomial. So we're talking about like x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, so on and so forth. And we're just gonna fit it to enough polynomials that we capture the properties we care about of the signal and don't capture the noise essentially. And so this was a complete failure. So here we fit it to uh, 15 polynomials. So that what that means is we had a constant term, x to the first power, x squared, x cubed, x to the four, all the way up to x to the 15. We just do a polynomial fit and then we plot the fit and compare it to the original signal. And so while this, <laughs> while the polynomial fit is a lot smoother than the original signal, it doesn't capture any useful information from the underlying signal. So this was a complete failure. So in the face of this failure, I had another thought. I thought, of course polynomials aren't gonna work here. Polynomials want to shoot up to infinity or shoot down to negative infinity. And here we clearly have a signal that is oscillating around zero. So when I think of something oscillating around zero, I naturally think of sines and cosines, which brings up the concept of a Fourier transform. If you're not familiar with the Fourier transform, it's one of the most powerful and widely used techniques in signal processing, math, and science. And so basically what we're doing conceptually is we're taking a signal, so our blue signal here, and we're gonna decompose it into a set of sines and cosines of different amplitudes and frequencies. And so notice this is very similar to what we did with the polynomial fit. So in the polynomial fit, we take the signal, fill it, fit it to a set of polynomials. You can conceptually think of what we're doing here as taking the signal and fitting it to a set of 
sines and cosines. The result of that captures a lot more of the <laughs> underlying signal, but we still have a lot of noise. This actually has even more noise qualitatively than the moving average solution. So if I were to pick between the moving average solution and this solution, I would pick the moving average because it is both simpler and qualitatively better. And so solution number two, attempt number two was yet another failure. And so now I'm starting to think more polynomials didn't work. They smoothed the signal, but they kind of smoothed it so much that we lost all the useful information. The Fourier transform may have captured the signal, but there's still a lot of noise. Is there something that's in between these things? And that's what inspired using the third technique, which is the wavelet transform. What we're doing here is the same idea as with the polynomial fit and the Fourier decomposition, but instead of fitting our signal in terms of polynomials or in terms of sines and cosines, we're going to fit our signal to a set of wavelets, which are essentially these wave-like things that are localized in time. And if you want to learn more about the wavelet transform and the Fourier transform, I have some videos on that. I have some blog posts on that. So that should be a good primer if you're completely unfamiliar with the technique. And so here we do the same concept. We kind of fit our signal to a family of wavelets, and then we just drop these higher order, these more detailed coefficients of the wavelet transform. And something remarkable happens in that we have a kind of Goldilocks smoothing situation. You know, it's not over smoothed like the polynomial fit, but it's not too noisy like with the Fourier transform fit. And so I shared the solution to my friend. He seemed really excited about it, really happy with it. So he's testing it out in his platform now, and hopefully it works out well. And so there's one key point here that is one aspect of data science that comes up a lot that gets me really excited, which is that so often data science techniques and solution are application or context agnostic. So for those of you who did see the video I posted on the wavelet transform, you might notice that the steps that we ran through to smooth this financial time series is essentially the same exact process we used to detect our peaks in ECG data. It's a great feeling when you can spend a lot of time working on a project and then somewhere down the line, like two years later, you come across a different project and you can basically copy and paste code from a project you did in the past even if the context is completely different, like with analyzing ECG data versus financial time series data. Okay, so that's basically it. I've also created a user-defined function to implement this strategy, and that is also available at the GitHub repo. And then here's a zoomed in version of the time series. So how would you approach this problem? Leave your ideas and suggestions in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing with others. And as always, Thank you so much for your time and thanks for watching.